This video is for reading number two, which is entitled, What is Racial Domination? So the authors begin with their definition of race, um, which that quote on page 20 reads, uh, we define race as a symbolic category based on phenotype or ancestry and constructed according to specific social and historical context. This is that is misrecognized as a natural category. So the reading then proceeds to kind of unpack uh, that definition. Um, so first of all, what is meant by symbolic category? Um, this means that it is something that was actively created and recreated by human beings. Um, it's not, you know, natural or inherent or innate, um, you know, human beings, use a symbolic system, the system of language, to kind of categorize and name, um, you know, things that exist in their social worlds, um, that represent social phenomena that, you know, they observe. Um, and so in this way, by emphasizing that, you know, it's symbolic, you know, it really is just, you know, emphasizing the, the constructed nature of race. It, it, it is a concept that was created, that was constructed by um, humans. And, and because it was constructed, um, you know, by humans, um, that does mean that exactly what race is, how people perceive it, the categories that they use to um, identify people, um, it's going to vary across uh, time and space. Um, and this relates to that third point um, that uh, race, particularly race in the United States, has a specific social and historical context. Um, so how we label people, the labels that we assign to people, um, the criteria that we establish for assigning racial labels and identities to people, you know, that is varied over, over time. Um, and so I have a slide that kind of addresses, um, you know, that kind of constructed nature of, of, of race. Um, and it begins with just kind of providing some more sociological background, uh, because when we look around and we see that human beings have physical differences, you know, they have different facial features, skin color, hair texture, height, eye color, um, you know, we obviously don't look alike. But just because we don't look alike, and in some cases even look very different, does that really mean that we are different races, that biologically we are different? Um, well, for a very long time, that was assumed to be the case, um, but that's because people were conflating or confusing, if you will, phenotype, which is, you know, what you look like, what people see when they look at you versus genotype, what your genes actually are. Um, what's really cool is, you know, at the end of the 90s and the beginning of the early aughts, um, the Human Genome Project was successful in mapping out the human genome, um, you know, uh, literally mapping out uh, the genotypes of, of humans and, you know, what uh, you know, what chromosomes, what genes lead to what traits, um, you know, this was a major, um, you know, biological uh, breakthrough. Um, and for those of us who study or are interested in racial difference, when they did that, um, there were some important findings um, in regards to, to, you know, racial difference and racial categorization. Um, genetically, when you look at the genotype of human beings, we are nearly identical. Um, less than 0.01% of the total gene pool contributes to racial differences. So that means that we share 99.9% .9 of our genes with all other human beings. Like that is way less genetic variation than like different breeds of dogs, cats. Hey, even fruit flies have more genetic variation than human beings have um, between each other. So even though our phenotypes might be very, very different, um, in terms of our actual genes, um, we're not that different. Um, and the amount of genetic variation within racial groups 
is, is greater than the amount of genetic variation um, between them, meaning that you are just as likely to have more genetically in common with someone who doesn't share your racial identity um, than you are to have, um, you know, um, more in common with someone who does share your racial identity. So, you know, just point blank, racial difference does not exist on the genetic level. But just because, you know, um, it's not biologically real, you know, uh, does that mean that it's, it's, it's not real? Well, as sociologists, one thing you can consider is there is the Thomas theorem, which basically just states, if people define situations as real, they're real in their consequences. So because racial categories were created and were given such power in societies, particularly American society, um, which is what the authors of this reading, you know, later go on to kind of emphasize, um, you know, those categories um, have led to oppression and inequalities. They make up, um, you know, a very key way of identifying ourselves as well as others. So just because we know that genetically, like race doesn't exist, the racial categories that we created don't align with our, our, our level of genetic differences, you probably shouldn't expect those racial categories to just like magically disappear anytime soon. Um, because even though how we discuss race, um, you know, as it being a social construct um, created by the process of racial formation, you know, um, the socio-historical process by which racial categories have been created, transformed, destroyed, um, with dominant groups having more power in this process than subordinate groups. Um, so, even though race is a social construction with, with little biological basis um, in a society that has been predicated upon race for so long that is still kind of dealing with the inequalities um, that kind of flowed out of our racial classification system, um, race is not gonna disappear. And so in that way, um, socially um, and sociologically, it is still very real. So while it might be, while it may not be a biological fact, um, it is what we would consider to be a social fact. Um, and so, you know, just a way in which a good example of, you know, how we can create these categories and, um, and, and those categories kind of reflect who is in power versus who is not. Um, you know, your, your book lightly touches on the rule of hypo descent, um, which later or, you know, was categorized with the maybe more common uh, term, the one drop rule. And it was this idea that one drop, you know, any known amount of minority blood or ancestry made you a minority, you know, and of course that, you know, flies in the face of, you know, what we might think about ancestry or lineage or really even genetics, but it just shows how um, at a particular period in, in time in America's history, there was a really uh, big concern about keeping the white race, um, you know, that socially constructed white race white. Um, and that anyone who was known to have non-white, uh, you know, blood lineage parentage was not going to be allowed to classify themselves as white, even if perhaps, you know, um, they even phenotypically looked white. And so this is really what makes, um, this is really what makes that whole definition of race, you know, so complicated. Because if we, you know, just say, oh, it's these categories and classifications based on phenotype or ancestry, that makes it sound much more straightforward than what it is. And, and that is the kind of the point that your, your book is making, you know, when they emphasize um, the role that society and history has played in creating these concepts. And so for this reason, you don't want to misrecognize it as being natural, right? You know, this isn't natural, this isn't biological, you know, this isn't something that was, you know, um, just in, uh, uh, inherent or, you know, naturally occurring. Um, these are labels that have been created 
usually by the dominant group in society, which in America has traditionally been, you know, white non-Hispanics of European descent. Um, but, you know, these were labels and these were categories created by that group to classify um, and, and to classify groups who they considered as being uh, not part of the dominant group, um, minority groups. Um, and then usually these classifications were used to uh, oppress them and to assert racial domination, which is the point that this reading eventually comes to. Um, but before we get there, let's talk about some terms that sometimes are used synonymously with race, but they are not, the, they do not have an identical meaning to race. So your book even says that they are overlapping categories, but they are not identical uh, terms. And, and those terms are ethnicity and nationality. So oftentimes when we talk about um, the concept of, of ethnicity, you know, what we are usually emphasizing is that ethnic groups have some kind of shared cultural kind of content, right? You know, they share some type of cultural heritage and whether that, ba you know, whether the basis for that shared heritage is in their language or their religion or even their nation of origin um, slash ancestry, you know, the idea is that um, they have some type of cultural component in common as opposed to race where of course is that assumed kind of perceived physical similarities, shared phenotype, um, which they then link to shared ancestry, but really um, is, is kind of, a, a lot of it is kind of based upon those perceived uh, physical, uh, uh, shared physical characteristics um, when we talk, when we discuss racial groups, as opposed to with ethnic groups, it is that uh, shared kind of cultural um, uh, component. Um, Nationality is, of course, you know, the, the, the nation, the country um, that you are from. Um, and so, and it's not necessarily the same thing as your nation of origin or, you know, your ancestral uh, origins where you're talking about maybe where your parents or grandparents or great grandparents are from. Um, generally speaking, if you are a non-immigrant, your nationality is going to be, you know, the United States. Um, if this is where you were born. Um, sometimes people use that term when they are really asking about, you know, race or, um, or even ethnicity, um, because people perceive it as being, um, they perceive it as being uh, less controversial, um, they perceive it as being perhaps um, uh, the more polite way to ask. But, you know, once again, because these terms are not synonymous, um, you know, if you're asking someone their nationality, that's not the same thing as asking them their ethnicity or, or their race. Um, but admittedly, uh, as you're, you're reading notes, you know, they do overlap and all three are what they described as being marked and made. Um, once again, just kind of emphasizing that their socially constructed nature. Um, and because they're socially constructed, the idea that they can be changed, reconstructed, you know, that, that you know, the definitions um, and the classifications themselves, um, you know, that they can shift. So, you know, the thing about, you know, emphasizing that all three of these are distinct, race, ethnicity, and nationality, is that most people, especially if they're not in a sociology course, um, tend to use them interchangeably. And so you're reading notes that, you know, some people find it difficult, you know, if they're wanting to emphasize, you know, that you know, racially, they may be black, but, you know, in terms of their ethnicity, you know, they are, uh, you know, Nigerian American, or they're, you know, Jamaican, um, or American, and if they are actually an immigrant from Jamaica, then they might want to even emphasize that their nationality is Jamaican. Um, but the trouble is, is that, um, and your book notes this, is that some people can more easily escape the conflating of these terms um, more so than others. Um, and a lot of that, of course, has to do with the role that United States policies and court decisions have played uh, over time in designating 
who gets to be considered white, um, who gets to be, um, you know, allowed into America, um, permitted to be an American citizen legally um, versus who does not. Um, and so, you know, once again, I have some background slides on that. Um, just kind of about, you know, the immigration process and the role that the immigration process has played um, in terms of kind of shaping and influencing our, our racial, racial classifications, um, but also, also kind of shaping, you know, how we think of citizenship and nationality in this country as well. Um, you know, what's very interesting is we call ourselves the land of immigrants, but historically, uh, America has generally been either ambivalent or sometimes even just straight out hostile to the idea of immigration. And, you know, that's not new. You know, you can look back and look at the late 1800s and, you know, the early 1900s at, you know, papers editorials, um, you know, at the time, and you can see that uh, Americans, um, particularly the, the kind of core group Americans that we call the WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, you know, they weren't happy when we had large immigration uh, influxes of the Irish or large, you know, immigration influxes of, you know, the Italians or other people or other ethnic groups that weren't considered as being necessarily um definitely you know uh part of that that wasp um you know that wasp uh core um and so when you look at the the kind of first real policy in america meant to kind of establish um you know uh, curbing immigration, restricting immigration, it was the national origin system, which your reading does talk about. Um, and it was, you know, introduced and then established um, in various, uh, you know, phases and stages between the years of 1921 and 1924. And it was basically a quota system that established specific quotas um, to countries to determine how many immigrants they would let in on those countries. Um, with some countries like African countries, Asian countries, Latin countries, um, they were they were just completely left out of the policy. Like you could not legally immigrate um, to the United States from those countries under the national origin system. Um, who they did want to enter were uh, Europeans coming from Protestant countries. Um, you know the uh, you know the the French and uh, the um, Germans and uh, the British, right? Um, the, they received the greatest number of immigrant spots because they were the group that uh, were expected to be able to most fully assimilate into that WASP core that we had that was the dominant group in the, in the US at that time. Um, other European countries that were not sufficiently waspy, maybe because they were too, uh, you know, swarth swarthy, um, you know, maybe because they were Catholic, um, you know, they received some immigration spots under this system, but not nearly as much. So that would be people, groups like, you know, the Greeks, um, the Italians, the Irish, um, and certainly, although the national origin system locked out pretty much all non-white individuals from legally immigrating, um, it also was meant to kind of curb, like I said, some of the groups that, um, you know, they were technically considered to be white, but ethnically they are, you know, ethnically they were seen as being somehow very different and not just different, but even inferior um, to the dominant WASP group. And so this system was in place until the 1960s. Um, and so when people talk about immigrating the right and wrong way, it's just worth noting that a uh, large group of people um, and, you know, in the world were locked out of immigrating to the United States legally while this system was in place. It got replaced by the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1964, which is also referred to as the Heart Seller Act. And even though we have amended and tweaked our immigration policies, um, you know, multiple times since then, kind of the key takeaway is that what we no longer do, what we no longer have is that quota system. Um, 
I won't go over it in a lot of detail here, but you know, this is now kind of what immigration looks like or looked like as of, you know, two years ago, pre-pandemic. You know, we accept a certain amount of uh, permanent immigrants each year. Um, we set aside some of those visas um, due to what's called family preference. Uh, they already have family here in the United States and we are reuniting them. And then we set aside some for um, employment. Um, and, you know, once you have your visa and you've been in the United States for five years or three years, if you have a, a, a spouse that is a citizen, you can then begin the citizenship process, which we call naturalization. Um, and it's just worth noting that both the criteria to be a citizen, certainly the cost that it takes to do this process, the amount of time, the fact that we have a, a kind of uh, a citizenship test to test your knowledge of United States history and random, you know, somewhat random trivia facts about the US, you know, all of this just kind of emphasizes the fact that we have certainly kind of increased um, it, it, we have increased the criteria that it takes to be a citizen, to have a, to have a claim on United States nationality. And so that also kind of impacts um, who gets to claim themselves as being an American. And this is, and this is what the authors mean when they discuss, you know, that all of these concepts, not just race, not just ethnicity, but even something that's supposedly straightforward, like nationality, is marked and made, right? We, we construct the criteria, um, we, we establish the processes and the structures that allow people access to being a citizen. Um, and we have done this, um, you know, historically, which your book provides you some additional historical examples, not just in regards to policies, but also in regards to court decisions. So the book then moves on um, by addressing what they identify as being the five fallacies about race or racism. Um, the first one is the individualistic fallacy. And so here it's the idea that racism is largely uh, exist at the individual level, right? So people, racist people have prejudices and, uh, you know, these racist ideas and beliefs, and they maybe even act on them in terms of individual acts of, uh, you know, uh, racial discrimination or, you know, uh, racialized violence. Um, but they say that, you know, this is a fallacy because it really ignores the ways in which racism has been woven into our social institutions and our social policies. And even though some of those, um, you know, were more historical um, at the time, you know, they happened uh, in history, um, the ongoing consequences and the ongoing kind of ramifications um, still exist. Um, and so, you know, the, the authors are saying, we don't wanna think about racism as being individualistic, as much, much more structural um, and, and institutional um, in nature. Um, the second fallacy about racism is entitled the legalistic fallacy. And so this conflates what your book says, de jure legal progress with de facto racial progress. So the fact that people can't legally discriminate anymore, the fact that there are these protections that exist in, you know, in regards to jobs, the job market, the housing market, um, you know, that uh, we're no longer during this, this time period of, uh, you know, segregated schools and, and Jim Crow policies where there were white and black only, you know, water fountains and, and that type of stuff. Just because we don't have de jure, you know, de jure um, uh, discrimination anymore doesn't mean that we've achieved this perfect, you know, racial equality. Um, there are many ways in which people still act in a discriminatory and a prejudicial manner, even if they are legally not supposed to. And part of it is, is, is oftentimes this can become very uh, hard to prove. Um, so um, that is the legalistic fallacy. The tokenistic fallacy is when you point to 
um, some people of color who have gotten ahead, um, who've achieved, um, you know, um, positions of power um, in the larger social structure. So like, for instance, someone like President Obama or Oprah Winfrey or Colin Powell, all these are people that you're, you're, you're reading mentions. You know, the fact that they exist at these high levels doesn't mean that these pathways and these opportunities are easily accessible um, or are being held by minorities in any real significant numbers. So the presence of tokens does not mean that racism doesn't exist. Um, which brings me to number four, the ahistorical fallacy. Um, so this is for all the people who want to deny history. Um, so if you've ever heard someone say, oh, well, slavery was hundreds of years ago, you know, um, you know that's ignoring the fact that after slavery, in, in most of the South, as well as some other parts of the country, you know, we had a time period, you know, that we called Jim Crow, um, where there was de jure uh, discrimination um, and racism was pretty much legally uh, accepted and, and, and even encouraged. And this lasted well into the 60s and even the 70s um, in some parts of the country. Um, and, and, and so the, the as well as the fact that the ahistorical fallacy ignores the ways in which history kind of shapes present situations, present circumstances. So, you know, for instance, in terms of like residential segregation, even if there have been active attempts to try to address that and, and, and curb, you know, dis discrimination in, in lending and discrimination in, 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 in practices that occur among realtors, um, you know, the fact that those practices happen so long um, has led to, uh, you know, uh, areas that are largely minority um, being less desirable, um, uh, having less resources, um, which then results in them having schools that have less resources. Um, you know, uh, people who own homes in those areas have their homes evaluated um, you know, uh, at, at, at lower amounts than if those same homes were in non-minority areas. Um, so, you know, so the ahistorical fallacy operates on those two levels, is, 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 is being willfully ignorant about the history itself, but also being um, kind of blind to the ways in which history still matters and still inserts itself in, in present day situations. Which brings me to the final fallacy, which is the fixed fallacy. Um, and this is for those who they say assume racism is fixed. Um, and they say that, you know, um, it can never really be addressed um, and it's immutable. Um, and so they pretty much, you know, think that uh, if, if the worst racism, the worst examples of racism have been addressed, um, then, you know, the concept of racism doesn't, you know, change or shift. Um, it just means that it's been, it's, it's, it's been, it's been fixed, right? So, you know, if you're defining racism as things like, you know, lynchings or, you know, segregated lunch counters, then you're going to say that racism is no longer a, a issue because now, of course, it is more symbolic or it's more subtle or it looks more like microaggressions. And so that's the fixed fallacy. Um, the reading ends with actually addressing the title of the piece. So you you don't you don't really get the 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 title, um, the, the primary subject that the title suggests the reading is going to be about until like the last two pages or so. Um, and that is, of course, what is racial domination? And they address this by, first of all, defining two aspects of racial domination, two ways in which racial domination uh, works. Um, it works at the institutional level, um, what they call institutional racism. And of course, uh, this is that systemic domination of people of color. Um, it's embedded in kind of the uh, kind of operating processes and structures of a lot of our social institutions, uh, universities, legal systems, um, and, and, and other, uh, you know, kind of social collectives. Um, and then there is the uh, interpersonal level. Um, so this is the level below institutions, but as you're reading notes, 
um, it's directly informed or influenced by the racism that exists at the institutional level. And so this is the ways in which racial domination can manifest in everyday uh, interactions and, and practices. Sometimes it can be overt, right? You know, slurs and violence, but oftentimes, especially in a lot of parts of society, it's much more covert. Um, you know, it's the ordinary practices of our lives, you know, not wanting to uh, rent to a person who doesn't look like us, um, not considering going out on a date or having someone as a study partner if, if, if they are of a different race, um, you know, particularly if we are a member of the dominant group. Um, and so what they note is, is that, you know, at the same time, racism is occurring on these two different levels, institutional and interpersonal. Um, it also isn't operating in a vacuum. It's operating in a context where there are these other forms of domination. Um, and so uh, the authors kind of address, uh, you know, the concept of intersectionality here, the idea that we have, um, you know, a multitude of social identities and they intersect with one another. And so in, for some identities, we might be more or less privileged. We might be in the dominant group or position. And for other identities, you know, we might be in the less privileged, the subordinate group. And our experience, of course, is kind of viewed and experienced through the prism of all of those intersecting identities. You know, we don't necessarily go through the world, you know, experiencing it as just one of our identities. You know, so for someone like me, it's not that I just experienced the world as um, African-American, but as African-American and a woman and middle age and heterosexual um, and English speaking and, um, you know, I don't have a disability, uh, you know, so, so there are several, you know, all of those are my identity and, you know, it's not really a question of which one is more important or which one is more salient in a specific context. It's the idea that they are continuously intersecting and informing um, how we perceive the world and how others perceive and treat us, um, which is another reason why it can make it hard to discuss domination um, because you have to kind of talk about all of these systems of domination. So, you know, I have some questions that, you know, once again, I just kind of encourage you to consider based on the reading. Um, and these questions are just meant as a way of personalizing the reading and helping you connect it to your own, you know, thoughts and experiences.